Shalom again. We continue now with part two on the topic I was sharing with you on apostasy or outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Apostasy or outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, when I was at the close of the previous part, part one, I uh, referred you to the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 4 to 6, where we saw that Scripture says clearly that all dominion belongs to Christ. That's right. All dominion belongs to Christ on this earth. But yet, having said that, we should be reminded by the words of Yeshua himself when he was standing before Pontius Pilate in judgment over the false accusations that were leveled against him by the high priests and the Jews. So I, here I quote from John chapter 18, verse 36. Yeshua answered, Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from hence. My kingdom is not of this world. And this is something we have to bear in mind. This present world that is constituted with its Babylonian values, its idolatry, is gross immorality, is opposition to Yahweh and all his laws and all his words. This present worldly system is not fit to be part of Yeshua's kingdom. We shall see shortly that one day soon he's going to come back, take over the whole world, but then he will demolish Babylon. He will demolish the worldly system and set up his system of righteousness. Let me take you now to the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verses 11 to 16. Revelation 19. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, he that sat upon him was faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he shall smite the nation, he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now this prophecy of the Apostle John, what he saw, and it's all revealed to him about the last days, is consonant with what Daniel prophesied thousands of years ago. That somebody called the Son of Man will be given dominion over the whole earth. But first, he must vanquish his enemies, he must destroy the worldly Babylonian system. He must destroy all the rampant idolatry and gross immorality and then rule in righteousness. The law shall go forth from Zion and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem, the law, the Torah. And you shall implement the Torah, all three aspects that we talked about in an earlier video, the temple ordinances, the civil law, 
and the moral law. Of course, the moral law is inclusive of the food laws, the, the laws of clean and unclean food that we should talk about on a future occasion. All right, so that establishes the point. Number one, Yeshua is coming back not to take over the Babylonian system and operate it, but destroy it and put in his own system, his own kingdom of righteousness. Number two, nowhere in scripture is it suggested that Yahweh wants his people to take over the kingdoms of the earth, the seven mountains, and then rule over them for a thousand years, and then hand over the rule to Yeshua after the thousand years. Scripture is very clear. Yeshua is coming back to rule and reign a thousand years, and his base will be the nation Israel, his capital, the holy city of Jerusalem. He will have a temple there. He will reside in a temple. There will be a prince who will offer all the daily sacrifices. And the Torah will be fully implemented. And those of us who are called, chosen and faithful, that would have been raptured before the seventh year tribulation, would then come back with Yeshua as he rides his white horse, and we will be with him as he vanquishes all his enemies. We shall be with him to rule and reign with him over the thousand year millennium. This is in scriptures, in many passages of scriptures, and it's not self-proclaimed prophets and apostles who are going to rule and reign with Yeshua, is those who are called and chosen and faithful. Now let's look at the instance of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, because that is touted by so many as the example of what could happen in these last days. So let's turn to the book of Acts, chapter 2, <coughs> verses 1 to 6. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all over the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, light as of fire, and it sat upon each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. And when this was noise abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because every man heard them speak in his own language. So this is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And uh, later you will see that uh, Peter will associate this with Joel's prophecy that we mentioned earlier, Joel chapter 2. So what do we get from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 6? First point, as Yeshua promised, 10 days after his ascension, 10 days, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the 120 disciples who were gathered in the upper room. They had been told to wait in Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. The Holy Spirit came with the sound of a mighty rushing wind. 
you know the, his name, title, the Holy Spirit. In Hebrew, is the Ruach HaKodesh. Ruach, Ruach means wind or breath. The Ruach HaKodesh, a mighty rushing wind. Thirdly, what looks like tongues of fire began to rest on the 120, the heads of 120 people. Not actual fire, but as light unto fire. It looked like fire, but it was not really fire. It was a tongue of fire, not a real flame. They began to speak in other tongues. Now here, Paul has a lot of teaching of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. One of them is the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues. So in the context of Acts chapter 2, what was this tongues that was being manifested? Well, the multitudes, you see, you, you must remember this, that three times a year, Scripture, the Torah, requires, mandates that every Israelite, whoever they were in the world, three times a year, they must appear before Yahweh in Jerusalem. And Pentecost, Shavuot, is one of those feast days. So there were multitudes gathered on that day of Pentecost, and they heard 120 speaking, each one in his own language. So imagine if there were 70 languages among those present, and the 120 was speaking in Hebrew or Aramaic, but each one heard it in their own language. Amazing. Okay? So this was the demonstration of tongues of the, from the Holy Spirit as a gift. However, note that unlike the prophecy recorded by Joel or Yahweh in chapter 2 that we came across earlier, no dreams or visions were recorded on the actual day of Pentecost. No dreams or visions. Next, nobody made any prophecy. Nobody made any prophecy. Then the important, another important point is, despite this obviously vast outpouring that yet Joel says on all flesh, how many people came to Christ and got baptized that day? 3,000 souls, 3,000 people repented and were baptized. Now that's not all flesh. That's limited to 3,000 people. They all heard the proclamations in their own tongue. They all heard Peter proclaiming Yeshua as the one the suffering Messiah who died for their sins, crucified on the cross, was buried and rose from the dead after three days, 3,000, only 3,000 souls came to Christ. And we want to note, you just go a couple of chapters later into the book of Acts, you see that after the miracle of healing of the crippled man at the porch of a, a temple by Peter and John, 5,000 came to Christ. So the numbers that came to Christ on Pentecost, only 3,000. Less than the 5,000 that came to Christ when a miracle occurred at the porch of the temple later on. So you want to put inverted commas to all flesh. What does it mean? Does the Bible have an inclusive meaning that everybody gets the outpouring. And this is what the NAR apostles and prophets are proclaiming, that one of these days, there'll be a vast outpouring of the Holy Spirit on everyone in the world, that there'll be mass conversions. From where do they get this idea? Okay, so, and please note that 
Peter went on to quote from Yael, Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32, using the same words in the last days in place of the word afterward. Okay, afterward. Afterward, you will see in the context is about Israel, Israel being re-established with agricultural fruitfulness and so on. Then it says after, afterwards, there will be this outpouring. So Peter was saying that this refers to the last days. Okay, now here we're talking about Peter 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago. Already proclaiming that he and the people there were in the last days. Now how do you reconcile that with what we normally associate with the last days? That we are in the last days, the last generation. Okay? Well, you must understand that to Yahweh, one day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. So between Peter and us, there are two thousand years or two days. So prophetically, he's correct. He was in the last days as we are in the last days. And if you know your scripture and uh, the week, the week of years of Yahweh, one week, seven days. So you've got 6,000 years of human history, followed by 1,000 years millennial rule of Christ. All these constitute seven days in the eyes of Yahweh. So last days, Peter's time, until our time. At Peter's time, four days, 4,000 years had expired. Between Peter and us, another two days. So we are in the last two days. So I hope that explains things to you. No cosmic signs were displayed, even though Yahweh said the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give that light, and so on. So there will be cosmic signs, and so on. No cosmic signs were displayed. And yet, Peter identified the event as an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, with 3,000 souls saved. And please note the context. This outpouring on the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago was not on the entire world. It was on Israel. The people gathered at the Feast of Pentecost were Israelites. And later we'll see, or shortly we'll see, that the second outpouring that everybody is expecting will be in the context of Israel again, and not the entire world. And that's where we turn to about Yahweh's prophecies, about the last days. The context is Israel, will be Israel. Remember I shared with you before about the rapture, that the rapture will take place, in my view, pre-tribulation, before the seven-year tribulation period. That's the last seven years of current world history, before the millennial reign of Yeshua. And um, so the context in the seven year tribulation is Israel, Israel, Israel. Because in the last seven years, the times of the Gentiles would have been over already. The remnant church would have been raptured already. The last seven years belong to Israel. So the old flesh. Yael referred to refers to Israelites. And he said they will prophesy. The old man will have dreams. The young man shall have visions. And the outpouring will be on Yahweh's servants. You see the translation in so many translations, the outpouring of the Spirit on your men servants, your maid servants, but the true uh, translations are my 
servants, my men servants, my maid servants, Yahweh's servants. And there will be wonders in the heavens, the earth, blood and fire, pillars of smoke. The sun will turn dark, and the moon turn blood red. Now, there's one event, an early event in the book of Revelation, when the sixth seal is open, these wonders are talked about. And the kings of the earth will all cry out, all cry out. The day of Yahweh is at hand. So, some people believe that the day of Yahweh will begin when the sixth seal is open with all these wonders in the heavens, the earth, blood, fire, and smoke. And if that is the case, then the outpouring for the children of Israel will occur just before that. But if you take a later event in the book of Revelation, the cosmic disturbances and so on, the outpouring will then be later, but still within the context of Israel. So let me go on. During the seven year tribulation period, there will be evangelism done. First, by the two witnesses. Elijah is most certainly one of them. Moses could be another um, candidate. If we read the fourth chapter of Malachi, it says they remember the law of Moses. They talk about Elijah must come. Okay? So, the law and the prophets, Moses and Elijah, two witnesses. And in the book of Revelation, we are told there are 144,000 people who were chosen from the tribes of Israel, 12,000 per tribe listed, who will have their mark on their forehead. The angel will put a mark on their forehead. Why? They will be preserved through all the wrath of Yahweh that is being, going to be poured on this earth. But no single Gentile is ever mentioned as having a mark of Yahweh on the forehead. And we saw in an earlier video, this mark says, or has the name of Yahweh written on their foreheads, stamp. In other words, you belong to Father Yahweh. And they are supernaturally preserved uh, during the wrath of Yahweh over the seven year uh, tribulation period or during that period. And in the book of Revelation chapter 12 verse 14, you also read about a remnant of the Israelites, obviously who have come to faith in Yeshua, that will be brought or taken to the wilderness and protected for three and a half years during that time period until Yeshua returns. So that will be the second half of the seven year period of tribulation. So all of these points that I have related to you prove that the great last days outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon all flesh in the world is a figment of the imagination of the NAR false prophets. Let me give you two other sources that confirm what I am sharing with you about the last outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You turn first to Isaiah chapter 44, verses 1 to 4. Isaiah 44, verses 1 to 4. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says Yahweh that made thee, and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jesurun, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, my blessing upon thy offspring. They shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. Outpouring on who? The children of Israel. 
of physical Israel, of the Israelites, the 12 tribes of Israel. And this again is confirmed in the book of Zechariah, chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. And it shall come to pass in that day that I'll seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I'll pour upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications. They shall look upon me, whom they have pierced. They shall mourn for him, as one mourneth mourns for his only son, shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. You see both Isaiah and Zechariah confirm what I said about Joel's chapter 2 prophecy of the last days outpouring the Holy Spirit. The context, Israel, Israel, Israel. And you may want to take note of Zechariah 12.10. What is the nature of this outpouring? What does it, would it do to the inhabitants of Jerusalem at that time? The prophet Zechariah wrote, It will be the spirit of grace and of supplication. In other words, the Holy Spirit will come upon the people there. Their eyes will be opened to recognize the Savior that they had crucified, now come back in glory as their Messiah, as our Messiah. They recognize the suffering Messiah is now the glorious Messiah. And what does that drive them to? It's the spirit of grace and supplication. Grace means they are given the ability, divine ability to see, to understand. And then supplication, they will fall down on their knees in prayer, in repentance, that's why, right, in mourning. And we are told that they will mourn 30 days over what they did to their Messiah and our Messiah 2,000 years ago. So there goes the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Nothing to do with what the NAR prophets are falsely prophesying and many other so-called prophets in the world have been prophesying, expecting this great outpouring and so on. Now let's turn to what Yeshua himself said. You will notice that in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 24 is about the last days, there is no mention of any outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Okay? The only thing that's mentioned is about the gospel being preached to every nation in the world. And here turn to Matthew 24 verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then the end shall come. Preach to all the nations. Notice Yasha said preach. He didn't say they will be converted. He said if we preach as what? As a witness to all nations. So all nations will know. Everybody in the world, no matter how remote, would know of somebody called Yeshua, or they call him Jesus Christ. Think of all the Christmas carols, the songs that are sung on Christmas, Christmas decorations, although commercialized and celebrating the wrong date for Yeshua's birthday. But nevertheless, during Christmas, the word goes forth. Unto us a child, a son is given, a child is given, a son is born, and so on. Right? The shepherds watching with their flock, and they heard the heavenly chorus singing and so on, all proclaiming the Son, Son of God, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Now, how many people in heathen lands who celebrate Christmas or turn on the radio or the TV and watch all these festivities, all the songs, the carols, and so on? How many of them accept Christ? But how many of them would have heard the gospel? All of them. So by now, especially mass media, social media, the internet, missionary outreaches, 
virtually every nation, and by every nation, you should translate as ethnic group, would have heard the gospel. And yes, I do not discount that revival can take place where small groups of faithful disciples fast and pray, but the fruits are usually not national in scope. Charismatic uh, Christian readers, sorry, Christian readers including Jonathan Khan are planning for national fasting and prayer in September this year. They want to pray for revival in America and also pray for re-election of Trump. However, in my view, if there's no genuine repentance, nothing will happen. Furthermore, when praying includes people of all faiths, what can be the end result? Interfaith praying. Do people of all faiths have the same God? In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, it refers what? To fasting and prayer by the people of Yahweh, the people who are called by his name. And here I quote from 2 Chronicles 7.14. And you should examine this verse very carefully before you come to any conclusion. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek their face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, heal their land. That's right. If those of us who are called, chosen and faithful, who want to intercede for our nation, we fast and pray, repent of our wicked ways. Yes, we still have wicked ways. Isaiah 55, we're going to study it very carefully. His ways are not our ways. In whatever we do, if we choose our own way, we are counted as wicked in His sight. Sometimes we're ignorant of this fact. Our thoughts are often unrighteous. So there are two things associated with repentance that we must be aware of. Repent of going our own ways. Repent of unrighteous thoughts. Because in Isaiah chapter 55, Yahweh declares, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. Even as the heavens are higher than the world, so are my thoughts and my ways higher than yours. I rest my case. I believe that with true genuine repentance, Yahweh will hear our prayer and He can heal our land. We said such a prayer several videos back. We are talking about COVID-19, wrath and mercy. We pray for the mercy of Yahweh upon our nation and upon the world so that Trade can resume, travel can resume, economic life can resume, unemployment can be reduced, or else we'll all be in the misery of a great depression. We need to fast and pray the right way. So, if you are disappointed with my finding that contrary to what many prophets or self-confessed prophets are proclaiming nowadays, I do not expect a vast outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the entire world with mass conversions. If anything, Yeshua reminded us, these days are as the lays of Noah and as the days of Lot. A lot associated with gross immorality, LGBT, gay marriages, Noah with wickedness overflowing the entire world and meriting what? Not the vast outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but mass destruction in the flood. 
So when Joshua reminded us of these two events, he's saying, Beware, in the last days, mass destruction of the wicked will occur. That's right. The wrath of Yahweh will be upon the children of disobedience. Father Yahweh, in wrath, remember mercy. Remember your servants, O Lord. We humble ourselves, repent of our wicked ways, repent of our unrighteous thoughts, and we commit ourselves into your loving hands. For we know there is safety in you. There's a place of safety in you for your people. We thank you, worship you, adore you. In Yahshua's most precious name, Shalom.